Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. Thank you for all that you accomplished today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a lot of important messages regarding the great work that Jesus Christ has accomplished. We talked about God's plan and purpose and calling from everlasting. God had everything set from the very beginning according to his word that he set, which is spiritual law, which would deal with any and every situation that might occur, whether it's obedient or disobedient, whatever might happen. Everything was set in, in, in order from the very beginning. We talked about what happened from the creation to the flood then. We talked about the covenants that God made with the people after the flood, which was to the seed that Jesus would come and fulfill them. Then we talked about how Jesus accomplished the legal work of redemption. It was a legal action that he had to take, take and bring into being to accomplish it. And also then the legal possession of the inheritance of the earth. As these two things are also, they're still at work. There's more to be done which will be accomplished. And then we talked about the chronology of the last week of Jesus Christ. And we saw the fact that he came in not on Palm Sunday, it's a lie. Instead, he came in on the Saturday Sabbath, presented himself, and then on Wednesday, which was Nisan Day 14 in 30 AD, he then, having been made sin, died on the cross, and then went down for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, paying the price for sin, and then was the first one raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, being born from above as he was in hell. And we will, of course, see these things, uh, the scriptures we talked about in the chronology of how this happened and the fact that on the third day, which was the Saturday Sabbath, is the day that he was born from spiritual death to spiritual life in hell. But then he was raised bodily on the next day, which was the first day of the week, as we pointed out. And we'll be seeing that today as well. Now, we're going to begin here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 as we see the tremendous work as we look at all the things that Jesus accomplished. Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Remember what was spoken to the devil back in Genesis 3, 15, that there would be one of her seed who would come who would bruise his head, break his lordship. And so this is here, the prophecy regarding that was going to come to pass. The virgin would conceive as the seed from the Holy Spirit was put into Mary, who was that one, who would then conceive and bring forth the Son. And who is he? He's Emmanuel, which means God with us. And who was this? This is the second person of the Godhead. John 1, verse 14, indicates the Word, who is the second person of the Godhead, became, not made, but became Ginnomai flesh, took upon himself a physical body. It was of like sinful flesh, remember, and he came and dwelt among us. And what did he come to do? He came to accomplish the work to bring man back into relationship with God for those who would hearken unto him and obey him. He was the one, of course, that was the Adam, like Adam, the last Adam, the second Adam, who came and he had to walk the walk that Adam had failed and we see in Hebrews 4, 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted in every way possible, and yet without sin. And what was his purpose, of course? To come and undo what the enemy had done. John, 1 John 3, 8 actually says this literally, when the last Part of the verse is, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, not that he might destroy the works of the devil. This would be the word apollomy if it was destroyed, but it's not. It's the word luo, which means to loose, or in this case, to undo, to undo the works of the devil. He undid the works of the devil so that now we could then see God's works be accomplished come to see us be firstborn, see the work of God come to pass, bring us to the place of being righteous and holy and like Jesus, and then, of course, be able to be with him in the millennial, Jesus in the millennial reign and in the new heavens and the new earth which will come. Now, Jesus went forth, he began his ministry, 
that we've talked about on the time of the Day of Atonement, there to begin to do the work, preach the gospel, cast out the demons, heal the sick, see people be set free from all kinds of bondages. He also, as he was teaching, he didn't teach Old Testament things, he taught New Testament truths. He taught about the new way of love. He taught about how the new way of prayer. He talked about in Matthew chapter 5 the changes from, I say, this is what you've heard, but I say unto you, giving all the New Testament changes that were coming forth. He talked about how everybody has to be washed or they're not going to have any part in him in John chapter 13. He talked about the Holy Spirit coming. Everything he talked about was uh, all in relation to the New Testament era, bringing New Testament revelation that was going to come in the manifestation when the New Testament was brought forth into being uh, after he had, of course, accomplished the redemption. Now, we also see, it's important to understand the feasts of the Lord which we'll just talk briefly about now, we'll talk later, beginning this evening. But Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5 speaks of the, there's seven feasts, and the four, first four feasts were fulfilled by Jesus in his first coming. And these first three were fulfilled at this point in time that we're talking about here in the first month. Here it says in Leviticus 23, 5, in the 14th day of the first month, and the first month is Aviv. At even is the Lord's Passover. It's also called Nisan. And so this was the Passover at the 14th month. And then the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Feast of Passover was when they would kill the Passover, and that's when Jesus would die on the cross, having been made sin. The unleavened bread was where they got rid of all the leaven, all the sin, is what it speaks of. And this is talking about putting away the sin. And then we see that first day was a holy convocation as we talked about, which was the high Sabbath that particular week. And then we come down to verse 10, when it speaks of, you'll wave the sheaf before the Lord, and this is the sheaf of the barley harvest, to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is on the first day of the week, when Jesus was the one who was resurrected bodily on that day and then was presented before the Lord as he was going to go up into heaven to pour out his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, as we see. Now, this last week, as we mentioned, um, in Exodus chapter 12, we see it speaks back here of what was going to happen on this time. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, he said, Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month, that was on Saturday, as we pointed out, when we looked at the chronology, not Sunday, on Saturday, the Saturday Sabbath. They take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb or a house. And so they would then, um, in verse 5, your lamb must be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you take it out from the sheep or from the goats. They would take this one out. And then it goes on and says, you shall keep it up till the 14th day of the same, same month. They would examine it. That's what happened with Jesus. He came on the 10th day, which was a Saturday. For four days, he was examined up till Wednesday. And when they were, of course, they were to kill this one. And this is when Jesus was killed on the cross. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Now it says in the evening, but that's not correct in the Hebrew. It actually means between the evenings as Exodus 12, verse 6 brings out, because the time when Jesus died was at 3 p.m., and that is between the evenings. And so he's the one who came and accomplished this work of the what needed to be done, and they examined him for those four days. Now, I want to mention to you just for a few minutes about the situation with the calendar. The calendar is different this year as far as our calendar as opposed to the Hebrew calendar. If you happen to have examined it, you would notice that it is different. You will see that the first day of Nisan, from a standpoint of our calendar, would have been March 11th, and that would have been the beginning of the year. But on the Hebrew calendar, they have it shown as April 9th, the next month being the first of the, of the year. Now, let's talk about the calendar so you understand things. First of all, the vernal equinox 
is the time where there's the astronomical start of the spring. And this year, it's March 19th, 2024. The first full moon then after that is significant because that has a relation to when they're going to have what the world calls Easter, which is a lie, of course, it's false, it's pagan, but what we would, of course, of consider, in a sense, celebrating what Jesus has accomplished and proclaiming his fulfillment of the first three feasts of the, of the, of the uh, seven feasts. Now, March 25th was the full moon. Then the way it works is after the first Sunday after that is when they would have this particular day that they call Easter. That's how the calendar has been set up in the Western nations. So that what would be this day, March 31st. Now the Hebrew calendar, let's talk about the Hebrew calendar for a moment. In verse two, this month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And what month is this? This is the month of Aviv, or what's also called Nisan. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, Observe the month of Aviv, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Aviv, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. So this is the month, the first month, known as Aviv. The B is actually like a V, Aviv. And what this is talking about, see, I put the cursor over it. This is talking about, if you notice below, the fresh, young, barley ears that come to the place of having the ear formed, which means it now has become tender, green. It's a, it's a young ear of the grain. And this is important because the month begins from the Word of God and also from the Hebrew calendar, the month of the first time when you see these green ears, ears otherwise the grain has been developed, that's when you would begin the first month of the year. So the first month has to conform to the greening or ripening of the heads of the barley in the fields of Israel. Well, there's people that look at this every year over there and they report this and, and of course I investigate that. Well, the first month of the year then, the way it works is after you see this newly grain, this barley coming to the place of being ripened, then the first month of the year is when the new moon, which is the first sliver of the new moon that begins the beginning of the month, would occur. Well, determining the ripening of the barley then is a key to know when the year comes. Now, it can begin prior to the spring equinox, which would be on the 19th of this month, or it can occur after that. It all depends when this happens. And the reason why this is important back then and relates to this is because Leviticus chapter 23, where it talks about the sheaf of first fruits. In verse 10, he says, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, When you become of the land which I give unto you, you reap the harvest thereof, and you bring a sheaf of the first fruits. What is the sheaf of the first fruits? This is of the harvest of the barley meaning that the barley has to have been harvested by this time, which means it's going to have to come to the place of being ripened first at before the end of the year, beginning of the month, so it has the time to, to then be harvested because they had to present a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest unto the priest. Therefore, that means that this is significant that the barley crop had to have first fruits ready for this wave offerings, what it was, or uh, the sheaf offering by the time that Passover and, and then unleavened bread and then first fruits occurred. So the barley crop had to be in a ripened stage by the beginning of the month. Now, the last month is the month called Adar, A-D-A-R, on the Hebrew calendar. If the barley was beginning to ripen in the fields by these last few days, then they would see it was a greening of it and therefore, that would be the month, first month of the year. Now, the Hebrew calendar, you have to understand, is based on the lunar. The lunar calendar is, if you look it up in different scientific means, it's 354.36707 days, which is 354 days, 8 hours, 48 minutes, and 34 seconds, actually, is what they tell you. So, this is about 11 days shorter than the solar year, which is what, 365 and a quarter, roughly. So, what happens now? The excess of the 11 days accumulates 
to, and when it accumulates to approximately the 30 days, which would be a month, so they don't get behind, then a 13th month is added to the Hebrew calendar, and that's called Adar 2. They have Adar 1, and then Adar 2, it'd be a 13th month. It's inserted before the first month, Nisan or Aviv, in order so that then, of course, everything would be in line with the Passover and with having the first fruits occurring in the spring, the barley crop being ready for the wave sheaf offering. Everything had to come in line. Well, this particular year, in, in, in over in Israel, the barley was confirmed on by reports on March 6th, 2024, by the people in Israel in several places, that the barley had come to the point of Aviv. Therefore, that made March 11th, being Nisan 1, actually the first day of the year and the first day of the first month, not April 9th. They actually, this is what they figured ahead of time, but it's all figured actually according to the way the barley goes because they had to have this sheaf of the, the wave sheaf of the harvest in order to present. So this means that if we look at this, this is in 2024, the calendar, and you can see what I'm talking about because notice here, here's Adar 1 and here is Adar 2 where they added in. This is the Hebrew calendar for here. Well, they added it in because they're going to kind of make up for these, thir these days that are added, but you know, you, still that doesn't mean it's necessarily right. It's got to all go by the barley being ripened and being green so it then could be harvested at the time of first fruits. So, if it was instead of being Adar 1, this would be March 11th, would be day one of Nisan, if it's then. If it was Nisan day one, and, and the Adar 2 was in there, and it was like they have it here, then Nisan day one is here, which is April 9th. So, on the Hebrew calendar, they have it as April 9th. But, that's because they added in Adar 2, just simply trying to make up the time for the extra month, which they're going to put in from time to time so they don't get this uh, back in the, in the winter time. It's got to be at the time of spring. So therefore, that shows the fact that they're, because of the fact that the barley is avived earlier, Adar 2 would not be put in at this point. This does change from time to time. After a few years, you see it on the Hebrew calendar where there's sometimes there's two end months after to try to make up for that because of the fact that, it, of course, it's 11 days short. So that means, if you also when looking at this, in that, in that standpoint, since the uh, day one would be this day here, would be March 11th. We would come to actually the 14th day was actually last Sunday, but it doesn't line up with what happened on 30 AD because here's what it was in 30 AD. In 30 AD, Nisan, day one, was here in March. And when we come to day 14, 14 was on a Wednesday, which is correct, which would have been April 5th in 30 AD. But the important point is it's on a Wednesday, which was necessary to have the one, two, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then being raised from spiritual death to spiritual life in hell on Saturday. And then the uh, next day, the 18th one, was the day when he would have been resurrected bodily on the first day of the week. So, of course, this is different. Every year changes a little bit in the Hebrew calendar of when you see the days, Nisan days fall as far as Nisan Day 14. So Nisan Day 14 is on a Sunday. Well, that doesn't fit with the other, but and which also would make the three days and three nights here, and then the 28th would actually be what would be the first, uh, the first day of the week, uh, comparing it to back in 30 AD. But of course, it's on a Thursday. So this is why the calendar, I mean, we're not, you can't, we're not on an exact day, it's not that important anyway. We're just doing it at the time of the year. We're proclaiming it at the time of the year. And the key is understanding the fact that the Hebrew calendar is not the same. And this is why you see things be different. Uh, don't be, you know, people have thought, well, I thought 
it's supposed to be in April or whatever all. Well, the Hebrew calendar is not right this year. They added it in, but none, they, again, they added in periodically, remember. It's just put in just to try to make things up. They don't, they don't know ahead of time when the barley is going to be aviv in order to make it to be the first. You have to look at it, and in Israel, they look at it the first. Uh, they're the last month of Adar coming up to the end to find out when this is aviv or when that would be the first day of it. So we thought we'd show you that just so you'd understand for anybody who has happened to seen the fact that the calendar of the Hebrew calendar is different from our calendar this year. But this is the reason why. So now let's see what Jesus did. We see that he's the one who was going to go to the cross. And we see in Luke chapter 22, verse 53, the statement he makes. I was daily with you in the temple. You stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power. The word power is exousia, meaning authority. It was the time of the authority of darkness because he was giving himself into the hands of Satan, remember, in order to be able to take him down to hell. And the reason, of course, because he was going to have the sins of mankind put upon him, which would cause him to be spiritually separated from the Father in a state of spiritual death being all the sins laid upon him. Nothing that he did, but all the sins of mankind laid upon him. We come to John chapter 10. Jesus, remember, was, they, he had, they had no right to take him because he didn't sin at all. He says, John 10, 17, Therefore, that my father loved me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He laid it down. He was simply made sin with all of our sins, but he never sinned himself. Remember, he's the one who gave up the ghost. He gave it up himself, having been made sin. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority, not power, to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father, because this is what was of a necessity in order to accomplish what needed to be him paying the ransom price and then to bring forth the reconciliation, the exchange, to become a firstborn and also to get to the devil, as you will see in a moment. And of course, what was Jesus coming to do? He was coming, of course, several things, but John 1, 29, John saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So he's coming to take away the sin of the world as far as what it had accomplished, all the evils, the destruction, it had come to bear it away. By no means did it get rid of sin. No, sin's still here, of course. The world's polluted with it. It's all affected by it. Everybody has sin, and you can, sin is, is this is the paying the price to take away what the sin of the world had done, which of course brought everything into all man and everything was in death. That's why he was going, when Jesus was going to destroy him at the flood, he was going to destroy not just the people, he's going to destroy the whole thing because the whole thing's been polluted by the effects of sin. We come to John chapter 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, not the lamb, but the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, meaning he's lifted up and he becomes a serpent. He was the lamb who went to the cross, but what happened to him on the cross? He became a serpent because of the sins laid upon him in a state of spiritual death separated from the Father. Now he became as a serpent, and that would be under Satan's authority to take him down to hell because of the sins laid upon him and because he was in a state of spiritual death having been separated from the Father who left him, remember. And this was all, what well, don't see talking about Moses lifting up the serpent. This is back in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21, this is when they had all committed fornication and they were under judgment. And so the answer was to, to solve this problem so they wouldn't all be killed. And the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, a serpent, set it upon a pole, this is a fiery or a bloody serpent it would refer to. Upon a pole, and it come to pass, everyone that's bitten, been bitten by these serpents, you know, when it look upon it, he shall live. Because what's he doing? He's seeing that somebody is going to take away the sin and going to take this away where? On this pole, which is a type of the cross. So 
Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, came to pass of a serpent had bitten any man. When he beheld the serpent of brass, seeing the fact that that sin was going to be taken on the cross, then he lived. That's pointing to what Jesus would accomplish. Now, and remember, Jesus gave himself into what needed to be done. He offered, he gave himself to die on the cross. Philippians 2.8 indicates that this is obedience. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He obeyed going through this avenue of death, even the death of the cross. So he was obedient to do this. Remember, uh, he, they had no, there was no reason for that him to have had been on there because he never sinned himself. But nonetheless, he was obedient because he was taking the place to pay the ransom price, the kinsman redeemer, in order to redeem man. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Now, how was he made a curse? When he was put upon the tree, because it's written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That's from back in the Old Testament. So, he became a curse by being put on the tree. Now, another thing that's important to realize, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 9, it indicates the things that were, there were there, actually there were three things that were in the ark. There was the law, there was the manna, and there was Aaron's rod that budded. And they all point towards Jesus. And here it's speaking about this rod. Exodus 7, verse 9, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then you're saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, which is a type of Jesus, cast it before Pharaoh, which is a type of Satan, so that's why he now becomes a serpent, casting it before Satan, and it shall become a serpent, which is what happens to Jesus on the cross. He becomes a serpent. Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, did so as the Lord commanded, Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Pharaoh also called the wise men and sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod, a type of Jesus, swallowed up their rods, which meant he was, Aaron's rod wasn't going to stay a serpent. It was going to be changed because it was going to become a firstborn, remember, Jesus would. And then, having become born from spiritual death to spiritual life, which is what this is pointing towards, he was able to swallow up their rods and conquer all of the works of the devil, which is exactly what he did. So this is all referring to what happens to Jesus when he's born from above, conquering the devil and all the demons, swallowing up all of their rods. Now what was Jesus doing? Of course, he was going to the cross to be made sin. We see the picture here in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, we pick up here in verse 4. Surely hath borne our griefs, also refers sickness, carried our sorrows, referring also to our pains, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This is what the Jews thought, because they were, of course, rejected the word of God. They thought he was being smitten of God which was all a lie. No, it was the opposite. He was given himself in order to accomplish the redemption. He was, but then it says what he really was. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He took everything upon himself that sin could cause. And then verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of the iniquity, everything from the, what sin would cause was laid upon him. Everything was upon him so that he could bear it away. We see he was oppressed, afflicted, opened not his mouth. Remember, when they were interrogating him, he wouldn't open his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment. Who should declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living. He died and left and went down to hell. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Made his grave here with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, therefore there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
The father wanted to bruise him with all the sin because he had to be the ransom price. He had to be that sin bearer. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul, his soul was an offering for sin. Remember, his body was in the tomb, but his spirit and soul, they went down to hell. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he says, he'll see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge that my righteous servant, Jesus, justify many, talking about mankind, for he shall bear their iniquities. The ransom was going to be paid. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil of the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He gave himself into it. And he was numbered with the transgressors, bare the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. So Jesus, having been made sin on the cross, we have to also see the picture of this, what we see in Psalms 22. In Psalms 22. This is where, having been made sin, the first statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This you'll see is from Matthew 27, where he spoke that, where the Father had left him. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Here he is, he's on the cross, and he has made sin, and the Father has left him. He said, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. And why would all this be? Because of having been made sin, you can imagine every sickness, every disease, every mental thing, every evil thing that could be laid upon him caused him to be so distorted, he didn't even look like a man. Everything was totally affected in his entire body. And so, my strength dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, brought me to the dust of death. So all the sins of mankind were laid upon him, everything. The dogs have compassed me, assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. Of course, that's what happened to him on the cross. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments from among them. Of course, that was what they, they did, remember? Cast lots upon my vesture. And so this is the picture of Jesus on the cross but they said, they'll come and they'll declare his righteousness unto a people that should be born that he hath done this. And this tells you what he's going, what the purpose is. He's going to bring forth the people that would be born because he's going to be the firstborn so that you and I could be born because there had to be a brand new creation. And that's the reason that he has done all of these things. Now, he was so marred, it says, he did not even resemble a man. Again, we saw everything was laid upon him, all the sins, every mental illness, everything possible was laid upon him. And we see in Isaiah 52, 14, this is a picture from the people who were there. As many were astonished or astonished or appalled, they were stunned at him because his visage, the way he looked, was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. It's like he was just a deformed figure that didn't even look like a man with everything laid upon him. It was unbelievable. You can imagine every sickness, every disease, everything possible, every crippling effect. His visage was so marred. That was what happened to him. That's the effect of all the sins laid upon him. Now we see Jesus as he is on the cross. We come to Matthew 27 and we see what was going on. It was the third hour when he was put on the cross, remember? And then we come to verse 45. From the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land to the ninth hour. This is now when the sins are all laid upon him up to the ninth hour. Sixth hour was 12 noon. Ninth hour would have been 3 p.m. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He spoke Aramaic. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Exactly what we saw in Psalms 22, verse 1, prophetic of what would happen to him on the cross. So he, now, having been made sin, the Father left him. Remember, he always referred to God as his Father. He always talked to him as Father, except till this point in time, when now he's not the Father anymore, he, now he's left. And that's because of the fact that now he was separated spiritually. That's what death is. Death means spirit separation. He was under spiritual death at this point, separated from God, the Father. And now he's simply God. 
And so here they come down to verse uh, 50. When Jesus then again cried with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Remember, he did not die by crucifixion, which is death by inches, which is a very cruel death, and where they'd be on a cross, they would keep pushing up with their legs until they had no more breath or no more strength to do it, and they would die and suffocate. Well, that's why they broke the legs of those malefactors that were next to them, so they couldn't push up anymore. They'd die immediately. Well, Jesus, he didn't die by that. He gave up with a loud voice, meaning he, he was simply made sin. And once he was made sin and the Father had left him, and now it was time for him to give up his spirit, he gave it up with a loud voice at that point in time. And this was at 3 p.m. on Nisan Day 14, which was Wednesday in, in 30 A.D. Now we see a picture further of this over in Leviticus. We see a couple of different pictures we'll bring up. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5. It says, He'll take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. So these two goats pointing towards what Jesus would do as the sin offering. It's a type of him. And one ram for the burnt offering. Now we come down to verse 8, and it tells us what he's going to do with these two goats. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for a scapegoat. Meaning there's going to be one reason for the Lord, but there's also going to be a scapegoat. Something else is going to happen here. The two aspects of what happened. He says, Aaron will bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, offer him for a sin offering. This is him offering and his blood being shed in order to pay the price for the sin. The goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. This one is going to be sent away to a different place, as you will see, because Jesus, it, he made sin on the cross, but then he had to go somewhere else. But this is the other aspect of what happened with that goat. Now we come to down to verse 14. They would take the blood, this is when the Lord, the first goat being killed, the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. This is where they would put it, on the east side of the mercy seat. Before the mercy seat, sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. And this is significant that it was only on one side of the mercy seat. He'll take, kill the goat of the sin offering for the people, bring his blood within the veil, do that with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And this was on the eastward side. Now, that's important because the fact that when Ron Wyatt is the one who was able to, as God allowed him to find the Ark of the Covenant, and he saw the blood of Jesus, and we'll point out in a moment, that was on the westward side. The east, on the eastward side, was all that blood from all these offerings, but no, was never on the westward side. That was reserved for the Messiah who was come and his blood was going to be poured out. We'll see that in a moment. We come to verse 21. Now this is the other coat. So the first goat gets killed. The second goat, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. This is the one that's alive still. Confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. The goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. What does that speak of? That Jesus, spirit and soul, going down into hell, a land not inhabited, where he was going to be paying the price. He was made sin on the cross in a state of spiritual separation, death, spiritual death, and then he went down, though, to bear the iniquities into the land not inhabited, which is hell. That's where he paid the price for the three days and three nights, having the, all, that, all the sins upon him. And so the two deaths are, and these two goats are, one was the physical death, the bloodshed, but then the other is the spiritual death with the separation going down to hell, paying the price for those three days and those three nights. Another picture here of this is the red heifer. And there's, there's information in the news these days 
about the red heifer. It's used one time in Scripture in Numbers 19, verse 2. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring a red heifer. And that would speak of someone who, of course, Jesus being the one whose blood was going to be shed. Without spot, he had to be without spot. No blemish, just like the lamb they had, and upon which never came any yoke. You shall give her unto Eliars of the priest, the priest who was going to kill him, which is what happened with Jesus. The priest is the one who offered him up. We'll see in a moment. That he may bring her forth without the camp. That's where they had to go outside the camp, which is where Jesus was slain outside, remember, the city. And one shall slay her before his face. This is all a type of what happened to Jesus as well. And the one was a picture of him dying for the Lord and then the other aspect of him going down to hell. This is simply the picture of what the high priest does and how it's, he's taken outside of the city and slain as the red heifer. We see this is referred to over in Hebrews chapter 13, this same thing in verse 11, where it speaks of the bodies of those beasts whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, which is what they did after they killed it. They burned without the camp because it was all outside of the camp. And then it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate outside of the city, pointing the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of this. So all these things that these people are doing, talking about the red heifer, does it have any significance whatsoever? No, because Jesus already fulfilled what this is all about. It's already been done. Does it have any prophetic fulfillment? No, it has no prophetic significance or anything at all. Why? Because this is, not ta this is all in Scripture talking about what Jesus accomplished and it's already been done. Furthermore, how do we know the times and what's coming? By what the Word says. We understand by what the Word says the two days and when the church age is over. And we understand the three and a half years of the tribulation period. We understand when the Antichrist is going to come on the scene in the first month, tenth day, and he's going to rule for the 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. We already understand everything by what? By the Word. Don't be moved by what all these people do out there. This is again the rebellious ones, the Jews who rebelled, and they're going to go through their motions trying to, you know, think that this is some special thing, you know, that they're going to usher in the Messiah and all that because they didn't believe. It's all just a bunch of rhetoric by the people who are rejected Jesus. So is there any truth to this at all? Anything to be considering? No. Don't even pay attention to it. If you get affected by this, what are you going to get affected by when the false prophets start to tell you all kind of signs and, and give all these things later? Don't be moved by these kind of things. It has no prophetic significance whatsoever. All those, all, lots of Christians, are all, they're all saying, every time there's anything that goes on, they think it has prophetic, you know, meaning. A big earthquake, a big storm, uh, you know. Uh, we got the, you know, the eclipse coming or whatever. They've been saying this, or the blood moons. They've been saying this for years. Did it have anything to do with it? No. It's all just people just don't know what they're talking about. How do we know what's happening? By the Word. The Word shows us the scriptures of what's happening, and we know when the time is because we understand the times and the seasons and what God has said in His Word is going to happen. So don't be moved by these kind of things and let them get you all going in this direction and trying to figure all these kind of things out. You're just going, you're just running around up there, running you around the barn, so to speak, and you're going nowhere. Where's the answer? The Word. That is the answer. John chapter 18. Verse 14. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Who was Caiaphas? Well, he was the high priest. So he's saying somebody needs to die for the people. That's prophetic of saying what Jesus was going to do. <laughs> of course, when they had the opportunity, uh, Pilate said, you want Barab Barabbas or you want Jesus? <laughs> they took Barabbas, of course, and of course, Jesus then was going to be the one who's going to die. But what was he really doing? He was dying for the people. Prophetic. They didn't, he, didn't, of course, didn't understand what he's saying, but that is exactly what was happening. Now, when Jesus was on the cross and having been made sin, what was he? He was the sacrifice for sin. And when he makes the statement, 
before he gives up the ghost in John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It's finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There have been many that have taught, see, that everything was finished, it's all done. No, it wasn't. He had to go down to hell for three days and three nights. He had to go through the avenue of death and take back the keys of hell and death from the devil. He's going to preach to the spirits in the upper compartment of hell. He's going to come up and get his body and go up to heaven and pour out his blood in the mercy seat. We'll see all these things in a minute or two. So was everything finished? No. Well, what was finished? What was finished now, and this is talking about what has been completed with ongoing effects because of a perfect tense. What's finished? The final sacrifice. There was to be no more sacrifices. That was it. This is all it was. it was. That's what was finished, the final sacrifice. Remember, he had to go down to hell for the three days and three nights, be born from spiritual death to spiritual life. Now, when he is on the cross there declaring it's finished and he's di he dies, what happens? He's the final sacrifice. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. Jesus cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost, and then what? The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Remember, God was in that Old Testament temple up to that point in time. Now, when this final sacrifice was offered, and that was it, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And notice, it was supernaturally by God because it was from the top to the bottom. This is like a the... the, 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 the Thing that was the veil that was rent was like 18 to 20 feet high, very thick. <laughs> it was God supernaturally tearing that thing. And what does that mean? He left. His presence left. The final sacrifice was done. That is what this is talking about. There was to be no more sacrifice after that. Now, over in Matthew's account in chapter 27, verse 51. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And notice what else this account gives you. The earth did quake and the rocks rent, meaning they were, they were divided. What would happen when the rocks were divided? There would be a means for something to go down from the rocks. What happened? Jesus' blood was shed. And what happened? Some of his blood went down through those rocks below. What was down below? Twenty feet down... From that place was the place where the Ark of the Covenant had been put that was there, that was moved from when the Babylonians came to try to get the Ark of the Covenant, and it wasn't there when they came to capture it and took them all to Babylon, remember. They couldn't get it. Why? Because there was a lever system that they had put in, and the lever system was able to lower everything below and then uh, down into Jer Jeremiah's grotto where they took it, they took it through the, the tunnels to Jeremiah's grotto where it was being kept. And uh, of course they couldn't find it. This is a lever system that they learned from the Egyptians who learned all about this, or the fulcrum and how to do a lever system. And that's how they lowered it down. And this is what was seen by uh, uh, Ron Wyatt who discovered all this. And when he then was led by the Lord to accomplish this, he was able to see the Ark of the Covenant and he saw on the westward side of the Ark the blood of the Messiah that had been put there that came down from this rent of, in the rocks where the blood went down on the westward side, not on the eastward side. That's where all the other blood was. But there was nothing on the west side until Jesus' blood came down and he found it on the westward side. He ended up having it uh, tested and found out it was, it had the what, chromosomes one set but not the other. It was, it was definitely not normal blood. It was instead supernatural. It was the blood of Jesus. And so we talked about that and went over that in the Blood of Jesus book. So the westward side, here the blood of Jesus was there. And that's the reason why the rocks were rent. So it would go down and it would hit that. Now, nobody's been able to get to that since. Some who've tried to get there died because they didn't have any right to do it. And they dragged their bodies out and they were dead who tried to get into the area where it was. 
There may be, one of the things that may be why the Jews come to the place of believing is it may be that God will open up that and they're gonna see, they could very well see, the, find the Ark of the Covenant and see that's the blood of Jesus. Uh, that was on blood of the Messiah on the westward side that was served for him. That means he did come because they're going to believe, remember. They're going to be turned away from ungodliness and they're going to believe. And they're during when? The time of the tribulation when the gospel is going to come for them for the last three and a half years, or which is the last half week of the 70 weeks prophecy of God's dealing with the Jews. So that's all going to happen. So now that Jesus had died at this point, where did his spirit go? Many people have thought that, well, he must, must have gone up to heaven, you know. No, he didn't go to heaven. First of all, they don't understand this verse. Luke 23, 46, when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This means he's placing it or entrusting it into his hands. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Well, did he go up to heaven? No. How do we know? We know he went to heaven eventually, but we know very clearly where he went first. As it says in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 9, Now that he ascended, going up, what is it but that he also descended, went down first, first in time, this means, into the lower parts of the earth. Where's that? Well, that's in hell. Jesus went down to hell first. Was this already told to these guys? Yeah, remember, they always wanted a sign. And he said, you know, only adulterous guys want a sign, but I'm going to give you one sign. The only sign he was going to give them was Matthew 12, verse 40. And this was the sign. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Seventy-two hours. That's how we know that 3 p.m. on Wednesday, when he died, 72 hours later would be 3 p.m. on Saturday. That's when he was born from spiritual death to spiritual life. On the third day, as the scripture says, that's not when he came up bodily. That's when he got born from above in hell, getting a brand new spirit after the three days and three nights. We know he was in hell. Actually, Jonah, here what it speaks of, a picture of this is shown in Jonah chapter 2. Here's where Jonah prayed in the Lord is God out of the fish's belly when he was cast overboard and went into the fish's belly. And notice what he said. He said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. I've heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. And this is the word Sheol, which means hell. Otherwise, it is prophetic of where Jesus went. Jesus went down to hell. And even in verse 6 even indicates this. I says, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. Well, it's talking about him going the fish's belly. Well, that's one he was there, Jonah, but this is prophetic of where Jesus went. The bottom of the mountains, that's below them all. The earth with her bars was about me forever. From hell's vantage point, it's like there's bars before you and you can't get out of there because you're in prison, see. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So he's in the bottom of the mountains, and the earth is with his bars, is about him, which is the prison of hell. We see the picture of this. Him in hell, we saw Psalms 22 was him on the cross, physically all the effects that occurred. But there's a picture of him actually in hell down in Psalms 88. In Psalms 88, Verse 3, my soul is full of troubles, my life draweth nigh unto, not the grave, it's a mistake. It's the word Sheol, if you notice below. That's hell. That's where he went. He just wasn't sitting, his spirit, soul, and everything wasn't sitting in the tomb. No, just his body was there. The rest of it, everything else went down to hell. We see in verse 4, I'm counted with them that go down into the pit. Well, that makes it pretty clear. Where's the pit? It's the pit of hell. I'm as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, where all the dead ones one were, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. They're cut off from thy hand. When people are cut off, where do they go? They went to hell. Everybody in the Old Testament went to hell. If you were a righteous one, you went to the upper compartment. If you were a, a wicked one, you went to the lower part in torment. So this is talking about he's now cut off and he's down in hell. And this makes it very clear. He laid me in the lowest pit. 
people sometimes assume, well, if Jesus went to the hell, certainly he would have gone to the upper compartment where he was in comfort. No, he went to the lowest pit because he was paying the price for sin. It wasn't to go there for comfort. It was going there paying the price for sin. And what happens? Sin would bring the judgment and the torment from it. In the lowest pit where it was the place of torment, he was down there. We come down to verse 8. Thou hast put away my acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up and I cannot come forth. <laughs> you can't get out of there. You're stuck. That's where man, all men were. Who all, Everybody went to hell. Nobody could could get out of there until Jesus came. And so mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. It was a terrible place of affliction and misery that he was experiencing down there. Now, we see also other statements showing that he was in hell in Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, these are pains he was suffering. That's in the lower compartment, not in the upper compartment where it was comfort. Because it was not possible that it should be holden of it. Why couldn't they hold him? Because he never sinned himself. It was our sins that were laid upon him. They couldn't hold him. We come to verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. His body was in the tomb, but his soul was in hell. Remember, he made his soul was an offering for sin as he went down to hell. And then in verse 31, he see in this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. The corruption is talking about his flesh in the grave. It didn't rot away because he came back in. His soul, though, was where? Not where his body was. His soul was down in hell. And we see a picture of what hell is like at that time. In Luke chapter 16, we begin here in verse 19. There was a certain rich man, this is not a parable. A certain one means a real one, who was clothed with purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was one of the rich guys. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores. Lazarus was one who followed the Lord, the rich man did not. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, more of the dogs came, licked his sores. Came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That was a place of, com of comfort, the upper compartment of hell, as you'll see. The rich man also died and was buried. Well, where did he go? In hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. He's not in the upper compartment. He's in the lower part, the place of torments. And seeing Abraham afar off, meaning from hell's vantage point, from one place to another, you could see it, but you couldn't go from one place to another. There's no way you could get through. He saw Lazarus in his bosom. And notice he lift up his eyes. If you lift up your eyes, that means you're below, and it's the lowest pit, and somebody's up above in an upper compartment. So there was an upper compartment at that time, and there was a lower compartment. He cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. That's what hell's like. Hell is a place of incredible torment. You can't even fathom how bad it is. Here, he just wanted even just a, a, just a dip of water to cool his tongue, just a, just a teeny bit. It was that bad. It's a place of incredible torment. Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he's comforted, and you are tormented. That is where he was at in that area. And of course, also you couldn't get from one area to the other. It says so here. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, a fixed gulf between it, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. You can't go down, you can't go up, you're stuck in the area where you are, so that they would come from thence. So, this is that. Now, after Jesus had done what he, you'll see in a moment, preaching the gospel to the upper compartment, there isn't any place of comfort anymore. It's, they all left. Now, hell is just totally a place of torment now, in this day and hour. We come to also see what else was Jesus doing. Not only is we going down to pay that price, Hebrews chapter 2 
Verse 14 also brings revelation of what Jesus did by going down to hell. Verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, through the avenue of death, he might not destroy, but really to, to, to put away, put an end to, um, to cease the effectiveness of him that was having, this is a ongoing, present tense, who was having the power of death, that is the devil. What was that? When someone died, they were taken down to hell. They couldn't do anything about it because they were under his dominion. Satan had dominion over all mankind until Jesus came, remember. So, and deliver them, talk about all the people down there who through fear of death, Jesus went through to get to him that had the power of death and also to deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject or under, they were bound to bondage being a slave. A slave of who? A slave of the devil. That's why they, they had a fear of death. You're going to die, and right now I'm going to go down and be a slave of the devil down in hell, and I'm going to be tormented. Or at best maybe be in comfort if I was righteous, but nonetheless I'm shut up in a prison and I cannot come forth. That was their destination all the entire time until Jesus came. Well, we come over to Acts chapter 13 now. In Acts chapter 13, we see in verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it's also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now what's he talking about here? This is from the second psalm where he spoke this prophetically. This day have I begotten. This is being born. One is now born by the Father. That's not how, how did Jesus come in to Mary? Just the Holy, Holy Spirit just overshadowed and put the seed in there. And she was born through the womb of a woman. This wasn't a born from, th this is different that's talking about. This is a being a birth from the Father, a different situation, as you will see. We see also in Hebrews chapter 1, it speaks of what happened. Verse 5. For unto which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, being born. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This word again is important to realize. It is the word pelin. And here, I put this already up ahead of time in Freiburg's. This is the word pelin. And it means denoting a return to a previous state or activity again otherwise coming back into a state that he wasn't in before. And Laonida brings it out, a subsequent point of time involving repetition, coming back to again. In other words, he was there at one point, now he's not, now he's coming back into that place again. That is what it's talking about here. So again, meaning at a later time here, a repetition, I'll be to him a father. It means he was a father before, then he wasn't. And now it's going to be again. And he shall be to me a son. And when was that? When he was born. When? Down in hell. Jesus was born from spiritual death to spiritual life, became a firstborn in hell after paying the price for the three days and three nights. Then, again, same word, a renewal repetition of this, when he brings in the first begotten, the firstborn, that speaks of what happened to Jesus, the firstborn. When he came into Mary, it was just the word made flesh. It wasn't a birth in the sense. He didn't come in there and be birthed. The woman was the one that gave birth to him, but it was the seed placed in him. This is a whole different thing. This is being born, brand new on the inside of you. Firstborn into what? This is into the world. Is that the first time he came in? No. This is not the word world. It's the word of the inhabited earth. Well, if he's the firstborn coming into the inhabited earth, where was he before? He was down in hell. Now he's come back into the inhabited earth, which is now up into the, the area, of course, the, on, the, on the, the surface of the earth. It says, let all the angels of God worship him. So, Jesus was born from spiritual death to spiritual life in hell, and we can see it again. 
In Revelation 1.5, it makes it very clear where he was born from. Revelation 1.5, from Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and the first born again. Where? Out of, ek is the prefix, meaning out of, the dead ones. Well, when he came into Mary's womb, was that the word coming out of the dead ones that came in them? No. This is totally different. Anybody thinks this is talking about the initial time he came in is not thinking correctly. This is talking about being a firstborn out of the dead ones, and this is plural, adjective. Where were all the dead ones? Down in hell. This is speaking of Jesus being born from spiritual death to spiritual death in hell, where all the dead ones, when he became a firstborn. And of course, why was that necessary? Because man was spiritually dead, so there had to become a brand new creation. And how could that happen? Well, there could be now a spiritual birth from above, from heaven, that the Holy Spirit would bring forth, and that's exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit is the one who raised him from this death down there in hell after the three days and three nights. And here it speaks of Colossians 1.15. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of what? Every creature or of all creation, meaning it's like there's a brand new creation that's come forth. Man was spiritually dead, destined for hell. That was it. It was all over. Well, there had to be something new. He had to become a new creation. He had to get a brand new spirit. Who had to get that for him? Man couldn't do it. Only someone who paid the redemptive price. And Jesus did it. And then would be firstborn from spiritual death to spiritual life. And Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. And also in doing so, he founded the real church. And what is the church? The church of firstborns. We see in verse 18, he's the head of the body of the church. This is talking about the church. Who's the beginning? The firstborn out of ek, the dead ones, plural again, we've seen it in the past, that in all things he might have the preeminence, the whole first place. He's the firstborn. Remember, he's the cornerstone of the spiritual house of God, which is the church. And that's important to realize. In fact, we even see that. We can look at that for a moment. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, calls him the cornerstone. Wherefore also it's contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Who's that? The one who is the choice, the chosen one, the precious one. It's a him. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded or disgraced or dishonored. Because he's going to bring you a brand new spirit and you're going to become a living stone in the spiritual house of God. And of course, what is the church? We pointed this out before, but it, it bears repeating so you understand clearly. Every one of these churches that have any kind of a affiliation themselves in their own little group or denomination or whatever is all false. There isn't such a one. There's only one church in the sight of God. To the general assembly and church of what? Not the firstborn, because this isn't talking about the church of Jesus Christ. This is talking about the church of what? When I put the cursor over the, there's no definite article below. Here's the word firstborn. And we can show you in the Greek here, when we look here, this is the word church, ecclesia. There's no definite article after it. And here is the word for firstborn, but it's not singular. It is an adjective, meaning a firstborn one, but because it's plural, it means firstborn ones or firstborns. So what is the church? Church of firstborns. How come people didn't translate correct? They reasoned in their own mind, I guess. These translators are all in trouble by changing the Word of God and not doing what is right. Remember, this was a plan that was hidden in God. You know, the devil knew nothing about this. If the devil would have understood this, would he have killed Jesus? No, he would have never done such a thing. And he operated through the Jews who killed him, remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, None of the princes of this world, of this age, knew. Had they known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because that was the avenue whereby he was able to pay the ransom price. That's the avenue where he was able to go and three days and three nights and then get raised from the dead and then get to him that had the power of death, take back the keys of hell and death. <laughs> That's the last thing they wanted. They did not understand what was happening. 
it was a plan hidden in God. And of course, what else did he do when he went, he took back the keys of hell and death, we know, because of Revelation 1.18, indicating what he did down there in hell. I, me that liveth, was dead. Where was he dead? Down in hell. Behold, I'm alive forever and evermore. Where was he born from death to life? Down in hell. And what then? And have the keys of hell and death. Where did he get them from? He got them from the devil in hell when he was down in hell, having been born from spiritual death to spiritual life. And, of course, when he came up, remember, now he had accomplished this, and he, took, he had conquered the enemy, took back the, that authority over, had the keys of hell and death. And he even said, when he came up and spoke to them in Matthew 20, 18, he said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, as people think, well, if all authority is given to him in heaven and earth, why do we still have then all this time that he didn't get rid of the devil? It's because of the lease. God's not going to violate what he did. The lease was given to man, so the 6,000 years had to be carried out for that lease that was in his hand, even though now we have two kingdoms. We have Satan operating and those who are under his dominion, and then we have those who are now received Jesus, all authority now, is in his hands, and of course he gives it into our hands because we're now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with authority once we come into him. Now, of course, we have, means we have authority over the devil just as he had all authority in the heavens and earth, just like you and I have authority. We have dominion. And so before Jesus came up out of there, though, we do need to see what he did. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. By which also he went and preached under the spirits in prison. When the people went down to hell, their body was in the tomb, but their, or wherever their place was, and spirit and soul went down to hell. So, their spirits were down there. They're in prison. Where's that? That's hell. What did Jesus do? He preached to the spirits in prison. That would have been the people down there in hell. Now, these people down there in hell, would that have been to the ones in the lower pit? No, they didn't. They were unrighteous. But who would have been? Chapter 4, verse 6. For this cause the gospel is preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Meaning, he preached to those who were in the upper compartment of hell. And what happened? These all, of course, received the gospel. They got born from the dead. They were born again down there in hell as well. And what was the result then? Now that they were right with him, they were able to come up out of there. And so what happened then? After Jesus had finished all of that work, which was happening, and then now the first day of the week when he's coming up to get his body, we do see, need to see that in Matthew 27, you have to understand that there is a scene, what happened on earth, then there is a span of time of what happened in hell that you don't see anything discussed, and then the next thing you see is you see the scene on earth again. Here it is. If we go back to verse 50, he cries with a loud voice, yields up the ghost. Veil the temple rent from twain from top to bottom, earth did quake, rocks rent. That's what happened on earth when he died. So, his spirit and soul goes down to hell for three days and three nights. What's the next verse say? Now it's the scene when he's coming up after the three days and three nights. The gray, uh, and having preached the gospel to those in the upper compartment of hell got born again. The graves were open. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. So this is the scene. There's just a gap of the time when he's down in hell that's not mentioned and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So they came up and got their bodies. One of the things you do need to realize in Luke, cha Luke chapter 23, many people have not understood this. Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus said, this is the malefactor who was calling him Lord. Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Now the King James says, Today thou shalt be with me, in paradise. This today really means what has happened today, which he called him Lord. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. They put the comma here, but the comma is not in the Greek. 
they put it in, the translator put it in. It literally says, verily I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Why would that be? Because could he have been that day in paradise? No. By the way, where is paradise? We should check that out. We have to understand where paradise is. Was paradise in hell? No, that was a prison. <laughs> it wasn't a good place at all. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. That's heaven. That's not in hell. I knew such a man, whether the body of the body, God can, cannot, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how he was caught up into paradise, same word, and heard unspeakable words is not lawful for man to utter. Paradise is in heaven. We see one other scripture that also relates to that in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him that conquers and overcomes and carries off the victory, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is where? in the midst of the paradise of God. It's not in hell either. <laughs> it's in heaven. So where's paradise? In heaven. So what is he saying when he said that you're going to be with me in paradise? You're going to be there. Otherwise, it's set. But was that going to be that day? No. Jesus went down for three days and three nights first, remember, before he went up. It, that's why it simply says that, Verily I say unto you, this very day thou shalt be in paradise later, not that day. So he didn't go up at that point in time. Where would that malefactor have gone? He would have down, went down to hell. He was down there for a short time. <laughs> and Jesus coming down there, he would have seen the three days and three nights going on and then getting gospel preached. He was down there a very limited time and would have come up there having been born from spiritual death to spiritual life. After Jesus came up and got his body, what happened? John chapter 20. Verse 17 shows. First he appeared to Mary before he went up. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He had not gone up to heaven, but he's telling her he's going to be going, and he says, Touch me not. He couldn't be contaminated by anything of, of, anything of the flesh. And so here he's going up now, and what does he do? Hebrews chapter 9 indicates in verse 11, Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, that's what they offered up in the Old Testament, by, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place in heaven, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is after he had accomplished all these things. If the blood of bulls and goats, ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified the purify in the flesh, that was the old, the Old Testament sacrifices, how much more shall the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offer Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So He appeared before the Father in heaven, offering Himself without spot before Him. We even see further down in verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood with tabernacle and the vessels of his ministry. All things by law are purged with blood. Without shedding of blood was no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens, which is where Jesus went, should be purified. Why did they have to be purified? Because Lucifer had contaminated the place, and the angels had contaminated the place who sinned up in heaven. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. And that is what Jesus did. He went up in his blood. He entered not in the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. It was just, remember, he only had to do it one time. Is the high priest entered in the holy place every year with the blood of others? No. Yeah, otherwise, he have to suffer from the foundation of the world. But once, here it says, the end of the world does he appear to the end of the age, not the world. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What age is that? The end of the Old Testament age. Remember, there were different ages that there were. He was the one who fulfilled that and finished that. It was done. Appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, 
And so he offered, once offered to bear the sons of, sons of many, and unto them that look for him, he'll appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming back, and he will come. And will, of course, and accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished and see the final part of redemption, which is getting a glorified body for us, and then the marriage going up to heaven, and then coming back and bringing the judgment on the nations before he begins his millennial reign for a thousand years, which those who are holy and righteous in the marriage will be with him. Now, so what did Jesus do? He had to be born from spiritual death to spiritual life to bring the new creation of man. He also, in doing so, in dying, he had made the New Testament with the Father, remember, but he had to bring this New Testament into being, but you had to die to be an heir, to have a, a right to the will as far as being an heir. That's why it says in Hebrews 9:15, for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first testament, which he paid for, that they which are all are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Where a testament is, that's a will. There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Is the will come in force before the person dies? No. But after they die, now the will is in force and the heirs have a right to the, the, all the, the blessings from that particular testament. A testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. This tells us something. When Jesus died, he died. When he got a brand new spirit, it wasn't the same spirit that he had before. It was a new spirit. He was a firstborn. He was a new creation, remember? A brand new spirit. So that getting a new spirit, now he would, could be the heir of this this testament and of course he is the heir of all things and you and I become a joint heir when we receive Jesus not only that but Jesus also came into the priesthood he had to come into the priesthood and he couldn't be a priest under the Old Testament that was only the tribe of Levi but he could become a priest under the New Testament which had a different priesthood Hebrews 5, 5, so Christ, also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said to him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Meaning, how did he become a high priest? He had to be born one. In the Old Testament, he had to be born one, the tribe of Levi. Well, in the New Testament, you've got to be born one. Well, this, this is a spiritual birth, a firstborn. And what is that significant for us? Because when you become a firstborn, you become a priest before God as well as a king as well. We are now kings and priests under the Melchizedek priesthood. He said another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. And the other thing that he brought forth is he brought forth the spiritual house of God, which is the church. And Jesus, we already saw, was the cornerstone. And you and I become living stones when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and get become a firstborn, you also, as lively or living stones, he's the cornerstone, you and I are we're all living stones in the spiritual house of God. And then the ongoing work that you and I are being built up ongoingly through the work of the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in our life to bring us to be that spiritual house that's to be built and you're at work to do these things. Now, that all happening, we also must see that after Jesus then came back and he appeared to them for 40 days and 40 nights, we see this mentioned over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen to them forty days, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He was preparing them for all the things that were going, they were going to enter into when they received Jesus. And then, of course, how did he finally leave? Verse 9, when he spoke in these things, when they beheld, he was taken up a cloud, received him out of their sight. That would have been the Old Testament saints, that now it would have been taken up before. He went up just himself, remember. This time, he's taken up all of them. They looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went. The old two men stood by in white apparel. And of course, they told you how he's coming back the same way. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up for you in heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Because he's coming back with clouds. And that's going to be all the ones from, the, from heaven 
that are born again, that are the saints, that are coming back with him in his second coming. Remember, they're going to come, the dead in Christ, and they're going to get their bodies first. And then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air in the rapture, and we get our change in our, we get the glorified bodies as well. That is what is going to happen when he comes back. Now, Jesus going back up to heaven, what happened then? He began his great ministry as he was inaugurated into his position as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hebrews 1.8, But unto the Son, he saith, who's speaking there? The Father. The Father speaks to the Son. He says, I have thy throne, O God. Jesus is God. He called him. God, the Father, called him God. It's forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Jesus now rules, King of kings, Lord of lords, with righteousness in his kingdom, ruling and reigning. And he's the one now, is Lord and Christ. And he's the one, of course, that has done everything that needed to be done for us to now come into relationship with the Father. And then when the gospel gets poured out on the day of Pentecost, that's when people who were alive then on earth at that time can then receive Jesus, be born from above, and see the result of what God purposed, which was 2 Corinthians 5, 18, all things are of God who hath reconciled, this is the exchange, us to himself, through Dia, Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of the exchange, this means. What's, that's the big thing. What do you preach to people? You got to get the exchange. Did you get the exchange yet? What exchange? A brand new spirit. Because your spirit's no good. You got to get a new one. And you're going to get it by being a firstborn. God was in Christ, reconciling, bringing this exchange of the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. This is why you don't tell someone they got to repent of their sins. Never tell them that. You tell them the gospel. They don't have to do anything. It doesn't matter they're the worst who a sinner in the world. What they need is to receive Jesus. They just need his new spirit. He's committed unto us the word of, see, they can repent of their sins afterwards when the Holy Spirit will convict them and bring them to repentance, not beforehand. It does nothing for them to try to change their ways or repent. That's ridiculous. It's all false teaching. They never preach the gospel by trying to get someone to change before. You simply present the gospel. I've got good news for you. The exchange is available. You need a new spirit. Jesus got it for you. You receive him, you have authority to become a child of God, and you'll get a brand new spirit. He committed unto us the word of the exchange. The reconciliation is the exchange. You get a brand new spirit. That is what God wants for all of us to preach the gospel to others. Well, we're going to now proceed to receive communion. We see the tremendous work that Jesus has done, those who have been, they're going to help on that. Appreciate your work. Let's go over a few things. Matthew, is they're getting it ready? In Matthew chapter 26. This is where they were in the upper room for the Passover. Remember, they were eating the Passover uh, that was the day that would be killing the Passover, but they were eating the Passover because they killed them the day before, remember, during the daytime, as we talked about. So they were eating, and Jesus took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to the disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Well, they were just eating this Passover dinner, which was the Passover Seder. Do we do that anymore? No. It's finished. We don't have anything to do with that because that was looking for Jesus to come. He already came. But at the same time, he's saying, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink ye of it all. Literally, it's everybody's supposed to drink of it. So this, what's this talking about? When you eat and drink something, you're taking it, something within you. And what are you doing? You're taking him within you. When he talks about the body and the blood. Now, this is the blood of my, the New Testament shed for many for their mission of sins. We've got a couple other things before we have you pass it out first. Look at this over here in John chapter 6. 
they really had a problem with this. John 6, verse 33. Jesus said, The bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives his life unto the world. Well, they thought it was, you know, they'd already been given that bread from Moses. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Then we come down to verse 48. I am that bread of life. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. So we're supposed to eat him. And we eat him initially as we receive him. And then we continue to eat of him as we receive the word because he's the word which gets written in us, in our heart, and in our mind. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Of course, we're, not, we're going now receive him the new, and receive the brand new spirit that he got for us, which is the result of what he did by giving, his, uh, giving himself. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This blew them away. They could, this sounds like being a cannibal. <laughs> they didn't understand, of course. He's receiving the person of Jesus Christ to come and dwell in them. Whoever eats my flesh drinks my blood has eternal life. That's right, because you're going to take him on the inside of you. Then verse 56, he that eats my flesh, drinks my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As you're going to keep on taking him into and how we're going to take him into him once we're born again, we're going to take the word into us. The word is going to come into us continually. As the living Father sent me, I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. That's right, because you've got his spirit in you and you're going to get the Word in you, and now you're going to live according to the Word of God at all times. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead, but he that eateth this bread shall live forever, because you are taking him on the inside of you. So, what does this speak of? What's communion speak of? It speaks about taking him on the inside of you. We see this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In verse 24, as we're doing this, and we're going to pray in a moment, why don't you start passing out the elements if you'd like, and everybody hold what you have. We'll be partaking it all at once. So they can go ahead and start while we're covering this. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me because of what he accomplished for us. The same manner also he took the cup when he'd supped. This cup's the New Testament in my blood. So therefore, the cup is the New Testament that I'm supposed to be drinking in. And what would that be? The Word of God of the New Testament. I'm taking in. Drinking is taking something on the inside of you. The cup's the New Testament, remember, in my blood. This do you as often you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we take, we take Jesus in, we take the Word of God in us, and we're drinking in everything of the New Testament now. Now that he's accomplished, so he does the total work in us, you're showing the Lord's death till he come. It wasn't just get born again and that was it. It's the whole package he's going to do. He's going to do a great work in all of us. We're taking the New Testament into us, see. But whosoever, therefore, wherefore, whosoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily, why, how would they do that if you're in sin? You cannot be partaking of these things as in remembrance of him if you're in sin. You'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You've got to be right with him, having, of course, been born from above and walking in line with the word of God. Otherwise, you'd be partaking of it in an unworthy manner. So what do we do? Let a man examine himself. I'm going to examine myself, be sure that I've confessed my sins and I'm right. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Thank you. He eats and drinks damnation or judgment. Otherwise, you can bring judgment on yourself by partaking in communion if you're not right with God. <laughs> you don't do, you don't partake of the things that he brings that's going to bring you life if you're not right. Not discerning and understanding the Lord's body of what he accomplished. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. It can cause sickness, disease, even death. And then we come to verse 31, thank you, where it says, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
So what's our job? Judge ourselves. By what? If I got any sin in my life, I need to deal with this thing. I'm going to judge myself, examine myself, and make sure I am right before Him. When we're judged, we're chasing the Lord, but should we not be condemned with the world? Of course, they're going to be condemned because they don't have Jesus and they have rejected what He did for them. So, here we see the tremendous things that Jesus has accomplished. And we're going to pray a prayer first of all, and then we're going to partake of Holy Communion as we're going to be taking and eating first in remembrance and then drinking of the cup. And remember, this is taking Him in you and taking the cup of the New Testament as blood. That's taking, speaking of the fact that you're going to take the New Testament into you, the Word of God, which is now is what you're going to walk by and have His eternal life operating in you. Say this, say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything that Jesus Christ accomplished. I thank you. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus. He walked the walk that Adam failed. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He carried out the ministry that was necessary. And he went to the cross and was made sin with all the sins of mankind. He went down to hell for three days and three nights, paid the price for sin, and then was born from spiritual death to spiritual life, becoming a firstborn of all creation. Having accomplished the redemption and the reconciliation, He made the way so I could be a firstborn. When I receive Jesus, I have authority to become a child of God and be a firstborn and become a part of the church of firstborns who is the church in heaven. I thank you that I understand I can only partake of communion in a worthy manner. Therefore, I am born again. I confess all sins that I've ever committed knowingly or unknowingly and I believe I receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. I have repented and turned away from those sins with a godly sorrow, working true repentance. I am now walking in line with the Word of God. Because I am doing so, I am worthy to partake of Holy Communion. And because of that, I will now partake of it in a worthy manner, in remembrance of what Jesus has done. Thank you for forgiving me, cleansing me by the blood of Jesus, and for everything that you have done for us in Jesus' name. Verse 24, when he given thanks, he break and take, said, this is my take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Then verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you, as oft as you drink, drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Now it says, as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we're showing the Lord's death. We're showing exactly what he's done for us. He made it so we could get a brand new spirit, a firstborn, taking him, eating, taking him into us. He also brought the New Testament into being. The Testament now that you and I walk after to see God accomplish His great work, the Word written in your heart and mind, the Word that is going to bring you to the place of total victory, total purification, be righteous, holy before God, become like Jesus and as the Father, the tremendous work that He will accomplish. So that's what His death has accomplished. 
You and I are priests before God. We're kings and priests. We have authority. We're to rule and reign. Sin has no dominion over us. We can walk victory, victory. We can be healed. We can be delivered. We can cast out all the demons. We can conquer every devil. We can see everything that God wants for us to come to pass because we are firstborns and now we are in the New Testament and we're going to walk by the New Testament and hear and do the Word and see God's total, complete work in our life. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank, you thank you for everything, for everything that Jesus Christ accomplished. I am a firstborn and I am now living as a firstborn citizen of heaven according to the Word of God of the New Testament. And I thank you that you are bringing forth your complete work in my life to heal me, deliver me, restore me, make me every wet whole, and that I become like Jesus and as the Father. And I will be ready for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ to rule and reign with him as a priest and a king for a thousand years and then be with the Father and Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. I thank you for everything that Jesus has done and I will allow him to accomplish his work in my life to see the complete work come to pass. Thank you for doing it because I am a firstborn and I hear and adore of the word of the New Testament in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God for what He's done. Father, thank You for all You brought forth. We will be doers of the Word. We thank You for everything You've accomplished. and We've done this in remembrance of You and what You are doing in our life as we are putting You in operation. Thank You for accomplishing this great work. We praise You for everything that You've done. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.